Hey, 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 you. Yeah, you. Remember Kevin? You like Kevin? No? Well, you will after this game. You know that emptiness you feel when you finish a game or an anime or a TV show or a book or whatever? Like you're sitting there and you're just thinking, damn man, it's over. What do I do with my life now? Well, take that feeling and apply it tenfold to this game. Like, I guess it's kind of different because I'm fully aware that this isn't the last Trails game by any stretch of the imagination, but dear Adios, I felt like shit after finishing this one. And yes, seeing that cutscene did probably play a big part in that. Those of you who've played this already know exactly what I'm talking about, but more on that way later. Trails in the Sky of the Third was released in the summer of 2007 for the PC. Just like the other two, it got a PSP version the following year, a PS3 version in 2013, and an Evolution remake for the Vita in 2016. But unlike the other two, this one got no localization whatsoever until 2017 when they made the PC version available worldwide. Now take note that there's a reason this game is called The Third instead of Third Chapter. SC concluded Estelle and Joshua's story. This game is more of an epilogue. I actually believe that they just literally looked over all the remaining plot threads and realized there was enough to make another game out of it, which is fine. I'm just saying that this game feels kind of disconnected as a result. Now hold on, hold your horses, make no mistake, the story isn't standalone to the point where you can just jump in. You still need to have played first and second chapter to understand this one, but assuming you have, it does kind of stand on its own, bringing up a new conflict and then resolving it within the same game. I'll try and keep this as spoiler free as I can until I actually get into the story, but there are a few details regarding SC that I kind of just have to let drop when I describe the setting. So if you're on this video and you haven't played any of the Sky games yet and you want to go into them completely fresh and untainted, which if that's your intention, you probably wouldn't be here in the first place, but anyway, this is your warning. So the game takes place around six months or so after the second chapter, and Estelle is not the main protagonist this time, Kevin is, which is pretty cool since out of all the main characters in the last game, he definitely got the short end of the stick, you spend the prologue crashing a very fancy dinner party and then he heads back to Gransel. When the floating city, which was the final area in the last game, when it collapsed, Zeiss Central Factory found a cube-shaped artifact amongst the rubble, and the Septian Church sent Kevin and his childhood friend Reese to go investigate it. Well, this cube isn't called Artifact for shits and giggles. It ends up sending them to another dimension later that night. The place is called Phantasma, and you'll basically be spending the entire game here. It's one giant dungeon that gradually opens up as you progress through the game, and I guess I gotta go ahead and address the elephant in the room now. This game is structured very differently from the first two, which leads to it being a pretty controversial entry in the series at least compared to the other games. People either seem to love this one or hate it. It's a dungeon crawler. There's still a story, but everything comes at you in giant chunks instead of gradually like the other two. And when I say giant chunks, I mean giant chunks. After you finish Kevin's dinner party assignment, there's like an hour-long cutscene right after, and you don't get to save again until you're in Phantasma. And usually plot tends to happen at the start and end of each subsequent chapter. It's also a lot more focused on the battle system, and at first I was elated, because like I said in the first few hours, the other games were focused more on dialogue, side quests, and character interactions, and the battle system was kind of just there. FC and SC always had me itching for a fight, and well, the third had plenty of encounters and bosses, and let me tell you something, it gets old very quickly. Looking at you, Chapter 6, but I guess the silver lining is getting tired of the combat does kind of clean your palate a bit, so... When you move on to another normal Trails game, I guess you'll be welcoming all the cutscenes and text back with open arms. It's like when you're playing a game and you get to that one water level that you just despise, then you finally get out of it, you get to like a normal level again and you're like kissing dry ground. Yeah, that's kind of how this game feels. The water level of the Trails series. The game is also a lot harder than the other two in my opinion, and it actually made me quite aware of how janky the combat could be at times. Take note that I was playing on normal. I never really criticized it much in the previous games, but I got real familiar with it after this game. The clock up and down spells are basically a necessity. There is no buff in the game that is more important than speed. This game has a massive cast of playable characters, so you most likely have the right arts and crafts to survive most fights. But none of that's going to matter if your character never gets to move though, so keep that in mind. And that last part mostly applies to the final boss when I say that, but since it's the final boss, I can't bitch about that fight yet until I start talking spoilers, so... But that's enough of me talking about the bad parts of the combat. What about the good? Well, thankfully, there's still a lot to like. Some enemies now have weaknesses to time, space, and mirage spells, which they didn't in the previous games. There are also new bonuses that you can get during battle. The other two games had stuff like extra strength, healing, sepith drops, or critical hits on the battle timeline. This game adds a few more goofy bonuses like instant death, guarding, and vanishing. 
The art system remains unchanged. There are a handful of new spells, but the increase in available arts isn't as significant as it was from FC to SC. Like I said before, there's also way more characters. Pretty much every playable character from SC is playable here too, along with two additional characters that become playable in this game for the first time. And for the most part, you can configure the party however you want. You're usually required to take Kevin and or Reese, but you can fill the other spots with whoever. You can also assign someone to be a support character. Each character grants various bonuses if you put them in the support role. Things like raising stats, giving more XP, increasing drop rates, and the like. By the way, you do unlock new characters as you venture deeper into Phantasma. Everyone got trapped inside these glowing stones, and finding them is how you'll acquire new party members. Sometimes it'll be a bit vague, but most of the time you'll be able to tell who's in the stone just based off of where you found it. The third does technically have side quests. Shortly after Kevin and Reese end up in Phantasma, they begin to come across these doors. They're broken up into three categories. Moon doors have lengthy side stories about certain characters, star doors contain short side stories that are usually about 15 to 20 minutes, and sun doors usually have a minigame associated with them. Now, while I don't like the third quite as much as SC, one of the things I actually preferred was how side quests were handled. I wasn't very fond of the fact that in first and second chapter, all the side quests were timed, so you kinda had to do them when they came in, and even the ones that lasted really long on the board would still need to be completed before you left the town at worst. I just had a hard time adjusting to the games basically telling me when to do optional content. And second chapter was the worst of the two, because it felt like you'd always get a slew of new side quests dropped on you right after something epic happened. Usually after you met an enforcer or something at the end of the last chapter and they dropped some juicy plot points or what have you. And like, side quests were the last thing I wanted to do at that point because I was hyped up and wondering what was going to happen next. Now I ended up playing both of these games more than once and the side quests were a lot more bearable to do the second time around since I already knew the main plot, but... I still didn't do all of them. So yeah, the cat's out of the bag. I imagine skipping side quests and trails games is probably like a cardinal sin against the Septian Church to some of y'all. Kevin's probably gonna come deal with me later tonight, so if this ends up being my last video, now you know what happened to me. May a thousand thorns adorn your quest with despair! I will say most of the side quests that I did do though were pretty meaty and left me pleasantly surprised. Yeah, some of them were just go to this area, kill this monster, and report back, but some of the others were actually fleshed out quests. Like you actually got to talk to some of the NPCs and get to know them better, and even members of the main cast got chances to shine in some of them. So I'll definitely try and be a bit better with this. When I move on to the next game, I'll try and do most of them, but getting back on topic, I do like how the third doesn't really pressure you into doing them. If and when you find a door, you can just leave it be if you don't feel like doing it or you don't have the right characters for it. Then you can quick travel to any of the doors you've already found and everything stays open right up until the final dungeon. I liked this because it means if I felt like blasting through the story and worrying about side content later, I could do it. And when I did go back and do most of those doors, I felt way more relaxed and kind of absorbed what was going on a bit better. Well, the only exception being that one, but you get the idea. Now, if you're feeling lazy, I can try and recommend to you the must-see doors. Is that a JoJo reference I see? It looks more like Fist of the North Star. Well, yeah, but I can't say is that a Fist of the North Star reference. It doesn't roll off the tongue quite as well. I did most of them and just YouTube the remaining ones I was too lazy to unlock. So, Moon Door 1 is a must. It's really long and they had to split it into two parts, but I found it to be pretty enjoyable. And most importantly, it rewards you with a craft that'll single-handedly turn Tita from the squishiest playable character into the goddamn Juggernaut. I'm the Juggernaut, bitch! Stardor 8 with Olivier and Mueller seems pretty important since they introduced a whole new character in that one, Portrait and all, so you know he'll probably be important later, I think. I don't know. He seems pretty important. Stardor 10 gives you an S-Craft for one of your party members, so make sure you do that. Thankfully, it's not too long. 14 requires you to have done all the other doors to open it, but it seems to have some pretty heavy foreshadowing. Just look it up on YouTube if you don't have all the other doors. That's what I did. And lastly, Stardor 15. FYI, 15 is that door, and even though most of it is just expanding upon one character, people have been telling me that the end of it actually helps you understand something that happens in the next game a bit better, so, you know watch it. Even if that wasn't the case, you still need to watch it, because if I had to sit through that shit, then so do you. You usually get money and some kind of reward when you clear them for the first time, which I guess is the downside to approaching the game the way I did, because those doors are probably your best bet at getting income because money is a lot harder to come by in this game. And because there's so many characters, you're always going to have a handful that are inevitably under-equipped because it takes big bucks to deck everyone out with the newest toys and shiniest equipment every time I enter a new area.
I'm not made of Mira. All right, time to talk about the story. So if you haven't played the game yet, this is your spoiler warning. If you're still here, I'm assuming you either played already or you don't care, so let's get started. Now the story, excluding the side content from the doors, is actually pretty straightforward. Kevin, Reese, and all your buddies from the last game got trapped in Phantasma, and you'll have to find your way out of there. Like I said, anyone who was playable in SC is playable here too. I think the only exception was Kurt, but you only used him for like a few minutes anyway, so I'll let it slide. Richard and Ren also become party members later in the game, so that was a cool bonus and they're both extremely overpowered, so they made battles a little less painful. There's this person called the Lord of Phantasma, and they're the one who's running the show. Oh wait, I forgot, we're talking spoilers now. So, the Lord of Phantasma's a chick, or at least she is for the majority of the game. She's constantly visiting your group and leaving the typical cryptic villain messages throughout. Oh, you'll never get out of this place. You'll be on death's door before you can reach me. Look how evil and mysterious I am. Insert evil villain laugh here. She also has this assistant named Schwarzritter, a very familiar looking dude who gets in our way a lot too. Okay, seriously, why did y'all even give him a mask? I mean, they do explain in-universe why he's wearing one, but come on, we all know who this is. Anyway, that's the gist of it. Most of the meat and potatoes lies with Kevin's story though. At the start of every chapter, you'll get little bits of his childhood and his early years working with the church. Kevin spent his childhood under his mother's care. They didn't have a lot of money, so they kinda had to just make do with what they had, and Kevin's mom would often sacrifice her own well-being to make sure Kevin was okay, and this really started to take its toll after a while. Miss Graham was coming real close to death and she became worried that Kevin wouldn't be able to take care of himself when she passed away. So one night, she went completely crazy and tried to strangle him. Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. Kevin fought her off and ran away from home. He came back a little later to find his mother on the floor. She had stabbed herself to death, and Kevin blamed himself for what happened to his mom. Kevin spent his days on the streets. One evening, a girl and her older sister spotted him in an alley. The little girl was Reese, and the woman was her older sister, Rufina. Rufina tries to ask Kevin what's wrong, and he tells her to piss off. It's not until she bird feeds him a chocolate bar that he finally starts opening up to them. Rufina sends Kevin to the Astor House Orphanage, and his time with them, while it came with his own challenges, was a pretty happy one. Rufina soon becomes a member of the church's Grouse Ritter, and Kevin himself becomes a squire not long afterwards. So they were out there, doing assignments, collecting artifacts, keeping the peace, killing heretics, and the whole nine yards. One day, Kevin was tasked with stopping some Jaegers that were attacking Astor House. Take note that Reese was still there too. Kevin found Reese's ribbon near a hidden door, which led him to a secret room where an artifact was being kept. The Jaegers had indeed taken Reese's unconscious body down there, and one of the Jaegers goes and grabs the artifact. The Spear of Loa. Now, the Spear of Loa was powerful but unstable. If you picked the thing up, it would basically turn you into a monster, which is exactly what happened to the Jaeger who grabbed it. He beats the shit out of Kevin and probably would have killed him, but Kevin ends up manifesting something called a stigma. Now, I'm still not entirely sure what exactly stigmas are and how they work, but in layman's terms, it's basically just a magical power up. Super Saiyan Kevin ends up absorbing the Spear's power and he kills all the Jaegers. Unfortunately, having just awoken to his stigma and not being experienced with it, in addition to absorbing all of that extra power from the spear, he couldn't control the thing. He almost goes after Reese, but Rufina, who had been out of town and just came back, runs into the room and takes the hit for Reese, which kills her. When Reese comes to, all she's told is that some Jaegers attacked the orphanage and Rufina died during the battle, which isn't incorrect, but obviously leaves out a lot of important details. Kevin blamed himself for Rufina's death, too. Reese became a squire sometime between this event and the first Sky game. After the whole incident at the orphanage, a woman named Ayn Selnit approaches Kevin. Now, Ayn is Kevin's current boss, and she holds the rank of Dominion, so I should probably explain how the whole ranking even works within the Grouse Ritter. So there are three categories. The Squires, who are basically just knights in training, the knights themselves, who make up the majority of the group, and the Dominion, who are the top dogs. The reason most people don't make it past knight is because you have to have a stigma to become a Dominion, and there can only be up to 12 at any given time. And since Kevin just got one, they're looking to recruit him. Kevin, laughing at the irony of getting a promotion when his main goal in becoming a knight was to protect Reese and Rufina in the first place, agrees to this and insists that they give him all the dirty jobs, deciding to call himself the Heretic Hunter. As you saw in the second game, Weissman was one such target. Kevin's thought process is that he needs to punish himself for all the blood on his hands. He keeps pretty much everyone else in the dark about his true feelings, and spoiler alert, Phantasma takes the form of an individual's memories. So basically, it looked at all the guilt he had built up and was all like, yeah, let me copy that homework. That's why places he's visited before and people he's known before appear here. 
Normally, it's kept under control by a spirit named Celesti, who's basically just the ghost of Chloe's ancestor. But then the Lord of Phantasma and Schwarzritter came as a package bonus, so that's why things are the way they are now. Chapter 6 was probably my least favorite chapter in the game because it kind of just felt like it dragged on and on. It was basically one giant bus... bus rush. <laughs> Boss rush. <laughs> I'm not editing that out. That was hilarious. Chapter 6 was one giant boss rush and you're teleported to four areas and pitted against pretty much all the minor characters who didn't get transported to Phantasma. And you're probably asking, well, how are they there to fight you if you just said they're not in Phantasma? Well, it's not really them, it's just copies of them from Kevin's memories, but they look and act just like the real ones, so for all intents and purposes, it's them. People like the Raven Gang, Philip the Butler, Killica. I didn't even know Killica was that good of a fighter, holy shit. You even get to fight Cassius. Yes, Cassius Bright, the Divine Blade. Cassius Bright, the guy who turned the Hundred Days War on his head. Cassius Bright, who had such a good reputation that for a good while people were calling Estelle Cassius's daughter instead of her regular name. Cassius Bright, the man who everyone's been hyping up to be the best thing in this game since sliced bread. Yeah, that guy? He lives up to the hype. I'm convinced that that's the real reason they require you to have Richard in the party for that section of the game, because if I didn't have him, I probably would never have beaten him. Schwarz Ritter was also pretty hard, so much so that both his and Cassius's fights let you temporarily switch the game to easy if you're having trouble. Turns out Schwarz Ritter was indeed Loe's ghost, surprising absolutely no one. The story doesn't really put on skates again until the beginning of Chapter 7. This is where Reese finds out the truth about what happened at the orphanage, and the Lord of Phantasma reveals that she's actually... Rufina Argent. Or at least Kevin's memory of her. He imagined that she low-key wanted him to suffer for killing her. Rufina's all like, y'all, don't be so shocked. This whole world was based off of Kevin's guilt. And Reese is all like, you're just a fake. The real Rufina would never want Kevin to suffer like this. Long story short, Rufina sends Kevin and Reese's pieces to Gehenna. Well, a Phantasma copy of it, but still Gehenna for all intents and purposes. This game goes from like super routine to super dark real quick and it kind of bugs me. As Kevin and Reese are making their way through, they run into the souls of some of Kevin's old targets, namely a random man he killed during one of his missions, his own mother, a child that he had to execute during another mission, they even find Weissman himself down there. The rest of the group figures out where they're at and they work together to distract the demon so everyone has an opening to escape. They get back and everyone starts making plans to head over to the Lord of Phantasma's castle. Basically, if they can defeat her, Phantasma will stop being all wacko and go back to the way it was, and everyone will get to head home. This is your last chance to visit any doors you might have missed or get some grinding done. And by the way, while we're on the topic of grinding, I do recommend you do it. You're gonna need those extra levels, especially on the characters that you haven't used for a few chapters. Everyone heads over to the castle, and even Gilbert, who's basically just comic relief at this point, gets a little shining moment on the way over there. At this point, you have 16 playable characters, and you're gonna have to use all of them. When I said grind out the equipment, quartz, and levels you needed before entering the castle, I meant it. Oh, you haven't used Josette since Chapter 2? Well, sucks to suck, she'll be participating in one of the biggest boss rushes the Sky Trilogy has ever seen. You have to split everyone up into four groups of four. You can configure them however you want, but just know that the group led by Kevin and Reese are going to be the guys going up against the final boss. The three bosses you fight prior to the final one aren't that bad, just make sure you have a good balance of a melee attacker, at least one arts user, and a jack-of-all-trades character that can pick up the slack if someone dies. I went with Sherizard, Agate, Annalise, and Zen for one group, Estelle, Joshua, Tita, and Josette for another, Richard, Julia, Olivier, and Mueller for the third, and Kevin, Reese, Chloe, and Ren took on the final boss. Now, one thing I don't like is how they make you do all the dungeon crawling for each group first, and then you fight the bosses all at once. What I mean is, you might be doing Shara's group, for example. You take down all the encounters, find all the chests, and make it to the boss room. Instead of getting to save, fight the boss, and then switch over to the next group, it switches over to the next group right before you fight the boss. So you end up fighting all of the castle bosses one behind the other. That means that if you get to the third or fourth fight and realize you need to change up someone's equipment, which happened to me when I reached the final boss, by the way, you're shit out of luck. That means you'll have to go all the way back to when you were controlling that group, adjust the person's equipment, then move 
forward, fight everyone, and then get to where you were at. Because God forbid you not know beforehand that the final boss can freeze you during the second phase of his hour-long fight. All right, calm down. So all that aside, the first three bosses you encounter, like I said, they aren't that much trouble. As long as your team is balanced, you'll pull through. Orbal Gear Tita was definitely the MVP here. Get you, dumbass! Kevin's group catches up with Rufina, except this isn't Rufina either. She's actually, drum roll please, a copy of Kevin's Stigma. Kevin Stigma says it plans to beat us and then take over the real world, and of course we're not on board with that. Now, the final boss theme is amazing, Best in the Sky trilogy, and the fact that it's basically a remix version of the opening song Cry For Me makes it even better. That's about all the good things I have to say about it though, because this thing was an absolute chore to fight. The first phase with the elemental pillars really isn't that bad. Clock everyone up when the fight starts and just make sure you have two people casting Earth Wall and Latir all frequently. It also helps to set Grail Spear as Kevin's S-Break, but if you're like me and had no idea what you were in for, you probably have Spear of Ur set, because that was his most recent S-Craft that you unlocked, so you'll just have to make do with waiting his turn and selecting Grail Spear from the menu. The second phase is where shit hits the fan. Like I said, he does have a few status ailments up his sleeve, but if you were unfortunate enough to not be properly protected against them, you got a lot of backtracking to do if you want to adjust any of those characters. You can cancel most of his crafts with Reese's Arc Fencer, so that's good. I had Ren spamming Earth Wall as usual, and he takes the most melee damage when he's in that red form, so if he's ever switched over, I use that opportunity to patch everyone up. He does have one craft, though. He just goes up into space and nukes the whole party. If you don't have Earth Wall or Grail Spear or some kind of invulnerable ability, this will one-shot your whole team, even at max. Imagine having like 15,000 HP and still getting one-shot. Ridiculous. After you beat it, it chills out for a second and turns back into Ghost Rufina. Rufina says that even though she's all calm now, it won't be long before she turns back into the stigma and goes full bitch mode again, so Kevin and Reese put her down for good. With the Lord of Phantasma officially gone, it wouldn't be long before the castle disappeared too, so everyone has to say their goodbyes. And you know what? I said before that this game was a lot darker and more somber than what I was used to, but Kevin's backstory didn't really get to me. Stardor 15, as bad as it was, didn't really get to me. The final boss Zeta flaring my whole group and undoing an hour's worth of progress almost got me, but I hung in there. But everyone saying their goodbyes? That was the straw that broke the camel's back, because as everyone started stepping through the gate, I realized something. I'm gonna miss these people! And I was already spoiled by the fact that old characters pop up in newer games from time to time, but I realized just how much I was gonna miss Estelle's fiery personality and Joshua reining her back in. I was gonna miss Tita and Agate's sibling-like dynamic. I was gonna miss Sherazard the Dom. I was gonna miss Olivier dicking around and Mueller scolding him for it. I was gonna miss Chloe juggling being a princess with trying to lead a somewhat normal life and Julia busting her ass to keep her safe. I was gonna miss Josette and Estelle constantly butting heads over, well, basically everything. I was gonna miss big old teddy bear Zinn. I was gonna miss Annalise, the connoisseur of all things cute. Ren was already my favorite out of all the enforcers introduced in the last game, and this game made me like her even more. Oh, by the way, she freaked out when Estelle and Joshua tried to adopt her, so I guess Operation Cuddle with Ren's gonna have to wait. Mission failed. We'll get him next time. And Richard. It's hard to believe he was the main antagonist of the first game because he's come such a long way since then. Apology accepted, man. Anyone who can carry me through the latter half of a game like you did is forgiven in my book. I thought Kevin was an okay character back in SC, but this game really made me like him. He made for an awesome protagonist, if only for one short game. And as for Reese... So yeah, that ending did have me choking up a bit. Not that I was out here sobbing or anything, you know. I guess all that's left to talk about now is the doors. I'm not gonna go down the list and talk about each and every one of them, but I'll briefly give my opinions on the little parts that stuck out to me. So can we talk about that guy from Stardor 8? Like, Olivier's planning to head back to Erebonia and get his shit together and make the Empire a better place, you know, something something politics. But apparently, while Olivier is the Erebonian prince, there's also this Chancellor, and he's got quite the iron grip on the Empire. Both of them have drastically different views on how the place should be run, and they spend a good portion of the episode talking about it. This dude does not look trustworthy, at all. Look at him, he might as well be holding up a sign saying, look at me, I'm bad. 
Also, I didn't really want to go and check the wiki to fact check anything on him because if I'm right about him being a major villain, I'm sure his page has an entire car lot's worth of spoilers. I mean, Alba seemed pretty nice in the first game and look at what he turned out to be. Stardor 14 describes what transpires on the Glorious after the floating city collapsed. Campanella attends a meeting in Weissman's stead. This is where they introduce the seven members of the Anguist as well as the Grandmaster. Well, their voices at least. They mostly talk about what to do now that they've lost Weissman, Loe, and Ren. They reveal that the whole gospel plan was just phase one of a bigger scheme, and most importantly, Campanella took the Oriole with him when he picked up Weissman's staff, so now we know he went and delivered it to the Grandmaster. Now it's time. Get the kitties out the room, because we about to talk about it now. Yes, it. That door. The one. The only. The infamous. Star Door 15. <laughs> I both love and despise this door at the same time. I love it because it's got to be one of the best examples of storytelling I've seen in this series yet. I despise it because it had me reeling for the rest of that day. The way they tell you what's going on is actually pretty brilliant, because you're suspecting what's happening, but you're in this constant state of denial. You're like, hmm, this sounds like they're sex trafficking children. Nah, they wouldn't go that far. And you're constantly telling yourself this. Every time a character says something that implies what's going on, you just sweep it under the rug because this is a wholesome trilogy about a twin-tailed tomboy and her stepbro with benefits. And it's not until they give you an eyeful of Ren's scarred, naked body that, you know, they finally just pull the rug out from under you and confirm exactly what you were afraid of. And as ugly as it is, you have no choice but to look it in the eye and accept the situation for what it is. Oh, you've still got doubts about what's really going on here? All right, bitch, doubt this. And while Ren did mention that this happened in the second game, she was very vague about it. She was like, oh, I got captured and mean people did bad things to me. Like, you know, that could mean a lot of things. I didn't think much about it back then. Now, there were some unused cutscenes that people dug up. They weren't as explicit as what actually made it into the game, but it explained in words what was going on a little better. Like, you actually get to see one of the clients come in and talk to Ren before he tried to, well, you know, use your imagination, because you gotta be careful what you say on YouTube these days. You know one thing I never really commented on, and I can't believe I put off mentioning it for this long? The music. I know I haven't really raved about any of the songs besides Silver Will and the game's final boss theme, but Trail's music in general is pretty damn good. At first, I didn't really think the town themes in FC were much to write home about, but it definitely hit different visiting those same places again in SC. Four Chromatic Towers has this nostalgic feel to it. I can't really explain why. It's not like I played that many RPGs as a little kid, but I don't know. Something's there. The field battle themes in all three games are pretty catchy, with thirds being my favorite of the three. Great Awe, which always played whenever you fought something big and SC was pretty good, and like I said, the final boss themes in all three games were excellent. And that's just, you know, the tip of the iceberg. I could make an entire video on the songs if I wanted to, but yeah. Trail songs, they're pretty good. The last thing I want to talk about are these Evo voice mods. It's not Bose, it's Bose. It's not Agate, it's Agate. It's not Renee, it's Ren. It's not Charizard, it's Charizard. It's not Mueller, it's Mueller. You get the idea. I only bring this up because I know some of y'all have been bugging me about not playing with the voices. Once again, I tried to get them installed for the Sky games and for some reason they just weren't working. I did manage to get the Zero Voices up and running without much of an issue, so don't worry, you won't have to hear me butcher those names again. The cycle has finally been broken. And that marks the end of the video, as well as the end of the Sky Trilogy. Feel free to leave a like if you enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel if you want to hear me rattle on about JRPGs or other Japanese games I happen to come across, and I will see you all again very soon.